Hello, London. We're in a Bitcoin uh, movie on Netflix. Uh, we sold Bitcoin right in front of the New York Stock Exchange more than half a decade ago. And uh, we opened up the first live trading floor, 100 feet from New York Stock Exchange. But how do we get there? Oh, so that's my first computer in 1978. I built it with a soldering iron. I got a mail order, but I built it with a soldering iron. I've been around a long time. That, something like my modem. I think there's a European sign, but I, I tried to find an image. I've been involved since that time. I've uh, put, um, I've tried to find ways to make money with my computers as a little kid. So I uh, made video rental software. Uh, Different, uh, I put my timer here. Different um, iterations of real, uh, real estate databases for real estate offices and uh, political data I'd sell, turn it into labels. Oh, the time's right there. So I was in a real estate uh, data business and the real estate uh, software business, and then I ended up in a real estate business as a young lad. I left school because there were a little, I was, ended up throwing spitballs. Uh, I did pretty well, and then the crash of 87 came along, and that was a life-changing uh, situation for me, because I'd gone so high up, and then I went all the way down, and then I became a commercial fisherman. Sounds a little crazy, but I was out in the end of Long Island, and there was a lot of fishing in there, fishing over there. And then I was, saw on TV one time that they had, uh, uh, Gre Alan Greenspan was the director of the Federal Reserve. They had his briefcase. One of the uh, newscasters, you can call them newscasters, I don't know what they are, news spewers, or whatever the hell they're spewing. But they said if his briefcase was a little narrower, uh, a little wider, then maybe we wouldn't have had the big crash in 1987 that turned me into a fisherman. And I said, well, who the hell is this guy? Where is he in his briefcase? I can't believe it. So, I ended up saying to myself, look, something's got to happen. I went to the library, learned all about the Federal Reserve. Found out that, this is the United States money, you probably heard about it. Uh, used to be uh, redeemable in gold and silver. $20 was a $20 gold piece. Uh, $1 was a silver ounce, right? And it was redeemable, it was a receipt for redeemability, you know, you, you got something back from the banks. All the banks issued it, the department stores had their own currency. It was incredible. Then the Federal Reserve came around and they did something called proof of cage, where they said, well, we're going to make everyone use this worthless Federal Reserve note. It says Federal Reserve note, it's not really United States, you know, I'm not, I'm not a trader or anything. It's the Federal Reserve, which is like a private corporation, the way I understand it. And so they made this note. They said, well, why would anyone want this note when they can have gold redeemability? So they invented something called the IRS. They said, well, they got to, uh, uh, December 23rd, uh, 1913, they did invented something called the IRS and the Federal Reserve Act, Act and they went together because it was like the first current uh, ICO. So... If you didn't collect a bunch of them all year and give them back to them, they put you in a cage. They put you in jail. So that was the upward pressure that allowed this Federal Reserve note to uh, take over the other currencies that actually gave you gold and silver. That's pretty good ICO, right, guys? Yeah, you got the Zimbabwe, of course. They had this thing was worth like 75 cents. People got paid three times a day because the inflate, the, they were printing so many of them that they were even more worthless as every day went, as every hour went by in a day. We all know about the Bolivar over there. My friend has a bunch of Bolivar in his pocket because that's how much his friend sold his, his uh, house for. Uh, just to remember that any fiat currency is doomed to failure. So we're talking about innovation without authorization. Uh, there's Wright Brothers, they had a bicycle shop, and I think if the Wright Brothers, one night with someone at the Wright Brothers, uh, uh, 
shop, walking by their shop, and they'd say, hey, what's going on over there? Then listen to what they were talking about. They'd think they were crazy, the arguments they would have in that shop in the middle of the night. I think if they went to the mayor, the mayor would not allow them to fly this airplane. Hey, mayor, can I fly? We're building this airplane, and it's going to fly like a bird. Can I get a permit? I know you guys are looking for which permit to get. I stayed in New York. They made a permit. They made the bit license. People call it the Nick license. They made the bit license because of our exchange that we built. So I'm sorry. But if I left like all my friends, I would have came over in a private jet. So the airplane was invented because no one asked for permission. And I, uh, I implore you guys, don't ask for permission. Well, this thing's going to be, you know, it's not going to be what it, want, what it can be because there's a little small window of opportunity for us to be able to get ahead in this uh, race. And uh, asking for permission is not part of it. If you ask for permission, then slow down. Find a place where you don't need the permission to go do it real fast. Ron Paul, he said, we've been overregulated, overtaxed, overregulated, overrun by bureaucrats. The founding fathers be ashamed of us for what we're putting up with. That's the founding fathers. I don't know if you guys know them. My, my guys put this together. But Ron Paul really inspired us because he was talking about uh, competing currencies. Uh, we marched on the Federal Reserve. Uh, I mean, for years, I've, I, uh, I found um, candidates, because I, I went back into politics, that would be against the Federal Reserve. I was involved with the End the Fed uh, movement and uh, all throughout the 90s and 2000s. And then, we found, and then Ron Paul ran for president, and he, he was the most visible person who spoke about this. And many of the early adopters are Ron Paul people. And I, uh, I'm very happy that happened. I ran his data. I was his uh, director of, uh, what was it? Voter contact. And uh, we built all these VoIP systems. I had uh, millions of calls made with about 80,000 volunteers. And uh, it was the most incredible campaign I was ever with, I was ever a part of. And uh, I think we got to go back and see that. But every time I had a candidate that would go against uh, the Fed, the news would come out and say how bad this guy was over and over and over, a week before, three weeks before, depending on how good he was. We were winning in, in Iowa, and then the media came out and just totally destroyed us, pummeled us. And uh, I was distraught. Every time I had a candidate, I'd throw my whole life behind it, you know? And every time, uh, the media would destroy us before election time. And then, uh, finally, you know, after a bit, you know, I read the white paper over and over and over and over and over and over, and I said, holy, holy smokes. I finally, I, I have a weapon that they can't destroy on election day. Finally, I have something, something impervious to their attacks. You know, maybe she'll go down a little bit for a couple weeks, for 18 months or eight months, something, but then she can come right back. Because of digital scarcity, they can't control the fact that there's digital scarcity, that that scarcity exists. So finally, I found a weapon, and I said, whoa. I said, this is it. I, I destroyed, every, I, I threw everything out of my life, everything. That would stop me. Now, I had a very lucrative, business in Manhattan, I sold uh, skyscrapers. I had built a bunch of uh, internet properties, like uh, uh, no more hotels, a uh, livery cab, uh, precursors to Airbnb, I mean, get a room also, Airbnb and uh, Uber. And I had a big staff, and I had all kinds of stuff, and I, I just, I totally ignored every, I'm still ignoring, I totally threw everything out of my life, and I said, you know what? I'm going to burn my ships. I just landed on this shore, and the first time in my life, 
I actually have a weapon against my owners, the guys that print all these pieces of paper and make me collect them all year and give them back to them. And I finally have a weapon against these people that made me a fisherman at the time, at that time before. And this is it. I have to, as a human, I have to realize my potential or realize that I can make a change. And each and every one of you can make a change. After you burn your ships, I landed on the shore. I'm not going to have my lifeboats or my ships ready to take me away from this battle. I don't care how many are in front of me. And you shouldn't care how many in front of you. And I'm going to attack. And that's it. I got my spear, Bitcoin, digital scarcity, blockchain, permissionless blockchain. That's another story. So, oh, that's my brother and I. <laughs> Sorry. I didn't put it in there. They, my guys, I don't even know what slide's going to be let next. So, <laughs> so what happened was all of a sudden they started saying how bad Bitcoin was around 2012, 2013. And then it came to a head in my brain and they said, oh, I got to do something. They're, they're, people should be adopting it even faster. So I destroyed the office. I broke all the furniture. And then I went and I found the largest space I could on Wall Street, 100 feet from the New York Stock Exchange, 6,000 square feet, about this big right here, I think. Yeah, about this big. And I opened up my own stock exchange, Bitcoin Center. I said, I'm open. I didn't know anything about it. I know you guys got PhDs or whatever. You worked in these businesses for a long time. But me, at that point, I have no fear of the enemy. I know who the enemy is. Central banks and centralization, <laughs> they're the enemy. So then I remembered my dad, what he said, he said, Tirio de Ginese, Antirio de Tros. My dad, a very powerful guy in his own right. He was born into, in, he was uh, raised in indentured servitude in Greece, during, right before World War II. And then uh, he took a toolbox from a German tank and he became a mechanic and he ended up and worked his way to the United States. Where he was a mechanic and uh, he had his own garage and he was a very happy man. And he told me, Thirio de Nieves and Thirio de Entros, he said, a beast, a beast you will never become unless you eat beasts. After you eat beasts, you can become a beast. So this legacy financial system is a beast. These central banks are beasts. They've been perched on top of us, sucking the blood out of us. We're, we're trying to get ahead and go up, and we're on some kind of escalator going down, getting more tired and decrepit, breaking our asses day and night while they just flip a switch and destroy everything you saved in a few moments. I get pissed. So I opened up right next to New York Stock Exchange, <laughs> Bitcoin Center. That's in that movie there the, on Netflix, Banking on Bitcoin. There it is. We had everyone in there. Andreas, Antonopoulos, every single person you've seen in the past has been there and spoke. Uh, it was an anomaly because it was so early, people didn't understand. The cops followed one of my kids with a FedEx package and wanted to know what was in the package. And I said, what do you mean what's in the package? He goes, well, isn't this the Bitcoin Center? I go, well, the fourth fucking amendment's in the package, I told them. That's why you're not allowed to get searched, you know? <laughs> so we build, uh, we do a lot of things. We build a, a paper ballot vote, uh, paper ballot voting machines that go onto three blockchains. We have a smart contract. Uh, Iteration of it too. We're gonna to do. A, we build the ATMs. They're all over the world. All right. <laughs> I don't know what that. That's me over there with the afro. 
Oh, yeah, they talk about Bitcoin being in the bubble. And I said, a long time ago, I said, Bitcoin's the pin, the pin that's going to pop this legacy financial system. It's a bubble. You know, it's not a bubble. Don't let anyone tell you it's a bubble, you know. Oh, yeah, they talked about every time how Bitcoin was dead, 23 cents. I mean, I remember many of them. $30 went down to, I think there, right there. Yeah, 23 cents. No, 50 cents from 20. I remember many of these times. And always someone said how Bitcoin was dead. Decentralization. Decentralization is what's going to free us. You know, for many years, millennia, as a matter of fact, it used to be we'd have like a cave with like 30 people or something, up to like 150 people, some number. And... Uh, then we became more, I, mean, I think it was because agriculture showed up, we became more top-down, heavy organizations with thousands of millions of people is where we're at today. But, you know, with the technology it, it, that they created to centralize, uh, and now the new technology is going to decentralize. And when we decentralize, we'll be free. And we have that moment in time right now. I don't think we're going to have a time because if we don't, actually free ourselves with the blockchain, they're probably going to imprison us with the blockchain. They're going to paint the box on the floor and you're going to have to stand in there or else your whole worth is going to disappear. Or who knows what they're going to figure out. In China, uh-oh, I'm not going to say where, but in some place, they have, they're making a credit system. If you're a good Samaritan, I think it was a Black Mirrors episode. With, I don't know, did anyone see that Black Mirrors episode that you're... Stock goes up or down, your people like you or not, and then you're not allowed here or there. Well, that's being built right now on somewhere in the planet. I'm not going to say where so they don't uninvite me again. I mean, you know, there's millions of people out there. They're not going to like what you're saying. When I did that, when I opened that place up, It was a whisper, I mean, meaning what Bitcoin was as a revolution, we couldn't even say it, knowing that it would come down even harder on us. They'd come down even harder, maybe. It was so, I mean, people stopped talking to me. They thought I was crazy. They, uh, well, they probably knew I was crazy. They, uh, many of you who've been around a long time have probably heard the same thing. You got the... Uh, uh, internet, gaming, uh, 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 game money, right, from uh, rewards for playing some game. And uh, the fact is, it doesn't matter. There's millions of people out there. They're all going to have some kind of opinion. You should not. You should, don't listen to them. <laughs> listen to your heart. I mean, you're here for a reason. I believe that you guys know why you're here. I think uh, the world, I believe, my father told me that too, that the world steps aside when you know where you're going. After you know where you're going, the world is going to step aside for you. So I think you have to make an oath here, right? <laughs> that you're going to move forward and you're going to promote this thing any way you can and you're not going to talk bad about one guy's ICO or the other guy. I mean, if there's an actual scam out there, call them up personally and tell them that you'll do all kinds of damage to them. But don't do it publicly. This is a very fragile time for us. It's, you know, we have to be very careful. So, yeah, decentralization is going to get rid of these guys. It's happening already. I think back here, uh, smart contracts are going to give regular people the power that the legacy financial system has now. And it's going to be provable, and the world's going to be wonderful. And it's up to us. And I believe that we need oracles. I mean, I've always been early with different technologies, and I believe that we're going to need oracles to uh, proper data to trigger these financial events on blockchains, on, on smart contracts. Um, IPO took over the, the ICO took over the IPO and raising. 
oh yeah, I built this thing here. No, I didn't build those two. I built the ones you don't know about. <laughs> get a room, no motels. Well, get a room we ended up selling. But no motels, a livery cab, years ago we built. They were early, we're always early, like 10 years early. I don't know why, I'm always early. And I think I'm early again, so I have this thing here. This is our, uh, this is how we're gonna prove that we're allowed to do what we're allowed to do because his initial Oracle offering, you know, data, zap.org is our project, and the data that triggers financial events on, on the blockchain is the future. It's happening right now. Good data, curated data, and uh, I believe that if, if you know, someone has data, or a company has data, I believe, well, in the States, I believe that it's uh, First Amendment protected, and uh, you can sell your data, like you're allowed to sell books and artwork on the street in the United States without a license or anything. I believe you should be able to sell your data, and, and all our lawyers believe it. So we built this thing called Zap. Uh, so we have these bonding curves here, so people have their data, and uh, we create a subtoken. Should have bigger numbers there, but we create a subtoken for each entity's data, and then people can sell it on this exchange. So the bonding curve is set by the provider of the data, and then people can buy into that bonding curve. They bond to it, they stake their zap, and then as, as then the prices go up on the fixed data, on the fixed uh, curve, and there's another with an order book that's not fixed, but you can set which curve you want, and then people buy the thing, and then when, buy the, the sub-token, and then when people need the calls for that data, they have to spend those sub-tokens to get the data. Yeah, we've been around. We're building things in uh, Saudi uh, with flow meters. Whoa. Whoa. Uh oh. So, <laughs> I think I hit the button too fast. So, we don't have much time. I think, I think everybody has to understand that there's only X amount of time that everyone gets, and uh, there's probably everyone says, oh, not enough, or maybe I'll sleep on this, I'll think about this some other time. I personally, I want everyone to have their own ICO. I want everyone to get involved somehow. I want everyone to push through it in social media and everywhere else. And then, like for me, for instance, I said, listen, I don't, I don't know if I have the time to build this thing out back then. Do I have the time? And I said, and then I remembered again what my dad said. My dad said, everyone gets X amount of time their X, you have to give more of you per time, more of you per moment. You have to give more of you per minute to achieve what you set out to do. You have to give more of you for every moment that you've been given as a gift. I and mean, that's why it's called a present. You should unwrap it sometime. And uh, I think they say that They said back then that the banks were do, too big to fail. And uh, I remember I was giving a speech introducing Rand Paul. And uh, I really, I mean, you know, you've noticed I don't really write a speech or anything. I just sit up here and talk. But I said that time, and it still rings true for this monetary revolution. I said, you know what? The banks are, are not too big to fail. I said to myself, I said, we, the people, liberty, liberty is too big to fail. And over here now, I believe, you know, Bitcoin is too big to fail. You guys for actually coming here are too big to fail. Don't let anyone tell you any different. You're here for a reason. I think that reason is to march forward to our inevitable, incredible freedom through decentralization and to push forward, if you don't understand all of it, 
Look it up. You got the whole damn thing. It used to take me three hours to get to the library to find out how to build this computer I built in 1978 because I couldn't buy one. Three hours each way. You got the internet right there on your fingertips. You can get a PhD in about three months probably if you studied. You know what I mean? You got to move forward. We're too big to fail. You guys are too big to fail. All of us, we're too big to fail right now. I see the future. They're running scared. They want to be part of us. Let them be part of us. Let the tent grow bigger. But if they start doing centralized things, curse the shit out of it. That's all I got to say, guys. Nick Spanos, ladies and gentlemen.